We were a bunch of crazies in a certain way, and it was an unusual time when crazy people were actually given a chance to do their stuff. My father spent his whole life just scribbling on blackboards, and then we moved to California. He was flying this glider off a cliff. I mean, I'd go up on, on Saturdays and watch, and he would get in this thing and be winched right over the edge of this cliff and fly around, and if he did okay, come back. And, and you know, my dad was doing that. He'd never, I'd never dreamed of him doing anything like that. So it made the whole idea of going into space just seem that much closer. Cars looked like spaceships, and uh, jet planes were flying overhead. They were building Atlas missiles by the hundreds. Orion fit right in. Project Orion was of its time. A time when cars had tail fins but no seat belts and rock and roll was playing on the radio. In Las Vegas, the Mafia were building the casinos and 60 miles away in the Nevada desert, the government was letting off the bombs. Nuclear weapons were uh, very much part of sort of the general consciousness. It was a Cold War situation. The Russians were testing above ground. The British were testing above ground. The French were testing above ground. Everybody and his mother was testing above ground. People thought it was essential to have these weapons and to have a, f a large variety of them, which made the whole thing possible because Orion worked on having uh, small, highly efficient, directed nuclear explosions. And if there had not been a Cold War to worry about, who would have spent the money on that? It would take a thousand bombs to lift Orion into space. More bombs would accelerate it to 50,000 miles an hour and still more would be needed to slow it down again for landing on Mars, or wherever. Maybe one of the largest challenges would get the bombs out of the ship in perfect sequence. So two to four times a second, either twice a second or four times a second, you have to eject a bomb from the ship. So that's a great challenge of mechanical engineering. We had consulted with some people from the Coca-Cola company because we thought that, that the, the machinery you need for handling 2,000 bombs would be somewhat similar to the machines people use for handling Coca-Cola bottles. And they had lots of ideas about how to grab these little bombs and move them down the racks and get them out the ship and bring the next one. You had to be able to select different flavors because if you... Uh, as you went up through the atmosphere, you needed to increase the yield, sort of the opposite of what you would think. And if you had a dud, then the next one had to be a half momentum charge. So you always had to be suddenly, everybody's wanting Coke, and then suddenly somebody wants an orange soda. You've got to be able to grab it and get it in line. In the years since Hiroshima, weapon designers like Ted Taylor had developed atomic bombs that could fit into artillery shells. The design details of the Orion bombs are still secret, but Taylor was confident that making them small enough and powerful enough was not a problem. And the final challenge, the easy one, is okay, how do you actually build the ship? You know, the part where the people live and have their reading room and, you know, groceries and kitchen and all that. And that's sort of the easy part, that's just shipbuilding. The sister company of General Atomic was building the nuclear submarine fleet. So the assumption was that if, if the project really got the go-ahead, probably they would have brought in the submarine people to actually design and build the ship. That the technical problems of building a submarine to go, you know, 500 meters down in the ocean are as bad or worse than the technical problems of building a vehicle for, for the vacuum of space. 
Certainly it looked much more like a submarine than like an airplane. It was sort of heavy construction with heavy steel, full of all kinds of heavy equipment. And most of it stainless steel cogwheels and drive shafts and, and a, a lot of just plain old-fashioned rotating machinery. Looking forward to Orion's maiden flight was a test pilot who'd flown every high-performance aircraft in the U.S. Air Force. Like an experimental airplane, it's something, it's there, you, you really want, want to fly it. And looking at Orion, it was the, the ultimate dream. It was basically riding a pogo stick, and that, that was certainly doable. I think it would be the most impressive, most startling, interesting, and in many ways beautiful spectacle caused by action by human beings. We were going to launch from a barge at sea to get away from the neighbors, but um, no, it would have been a very, very loud and very impressive event. It would, be, it would be going up from the surface of the ocean, bump, 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 like that, going up, bigger explosion each time. It must be 50 years or so since I heard about Project Orion. I am sure the idea startled me, this concept of using nuclear bombs, bang, 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 to drive yourself around the solar system. But I don't think I, even then I dismissed it. Every time I get into a motor car, I'm driven around by a series of rapid explosions. Orion isn't a crazy idea even now. It's an ambitious one, but it certainly isn't crazy. The idea is not crazy, it's that the idea that we might do it might be crazy. It'll soon be half a century since Stanley Kubrick wrote to me and said he wanted to make the proverbial good science fiction movie. Well, we were planning to film 2001. Stanley and I thought of using that technology. It might have been quite spectacular, although I believe that when atomic bombs do go off in space, uh, you don't see a great deal. I think Stanley wanted to avoid the Orion concept because he just made Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. And he felt that having done that, he didn't want to do anything more in connection with atomic bombs. Freeman Dyson who's uh, one of the few authentic geniuses I've ever met. Uh, he wrote a wonderful book called Disturbing the Universe, and he, he would like to uh, rearrange the solar system and make it nearer to our heart's desire. And, and that is something which I'm sure will happen in the next few centuries. Something like Mars by 1965 and Saturn by 1970 was the sort of the slogan we went by. Establishing human colonies was certainly part of our plan, and not only humans, but of course crop plants and everything else that goes with it. So we wanted to find places which were hospitable to life, and of course for that Mars was the obvious choice. We didn't imagine that you'd...